I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to talk a little bit about what the scripture says about the resurrection, right? And um, as we've been reading the Apostles' Creed, you know, we're today on that sentence that says, and on the third day, he rose again. Some say, as on, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And as I was thinking about this message, I was starting to think about all the religions in the world. You know, we live in a world that is full of religions. There are so many. Do you actually know how many religions are in the world? I actually looked it up for you. But based on the editor of World Christian Encyclopedia, there are 19 major world religions. 19. Now, those are divided into 270 large religious groups and many, many smaller ones. I guess it's so many they didn't put a number to it. But 19 major religions divided into 270 religious groups. And did you know that of all of those religions, of all of those groups, there is only one that claims that their deity is alive today? Only one. And that is Christianity, of course. We're the only ones that make a claim of a resurrected deity. And, and so as we continue studying the Apostles' Creed, we come to this defining point in the Creed. The assertion that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. This is a defining point. Why? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to the Christian faith. If you take the resurrection of Christ out of the Christian faith, we have absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. It is central. Theologian Gerald Collins put it this way. He said, in a profound sense, Christianity without the resurrection is not simply Christianity without its final chapter. It is not Christianity at all. At all. Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Christ, if you haven't read it, I recommend you read this book, The Case for Christ. It says, the resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. It is proof of his triumph over sin and death. It is the foreshadowing of the resurrection of the followers. It is the basis of the Christian hope. It's the miracle of miracles. And I don't think anybody said it better than the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. It can't be any clearer than that, right? Jesus Christ's resurrection is the central truth of our Christian faith. And therefore, we need to understand what is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and what does that mean to me? as a believer, right? I, I, today, this morning, I want to answer a couple of questions. First of all, if my Christian faith is based on the resurrection, then how can be, I be sure that it actually happened, right? It's an honest question. How can I be sure that this is true? If it's a central piece and I'm asking you to believe it and I'm asking myself that I, to believe it, how can I be sure that it actually happened? The second question is, if it actually happened, then what does the resurrection of Christ mean to me as a believer? Well, really, so if I'm going to believe this, that it happened, then what does it mean? How can it change my life? Okay, so as we study today, I want us to have these two questions in mind, and I'm going to try to answer them this morning. The first thing I'm going to say is that the resurrection of Jesus was witnessed. The resurrection of Jesus was witnessed. Now, we all know that there were theories going around about the resurrection of Christ. Some theories was, for example, that the disciples had stolen the body. 
Okay, but if you know anything about the Roman soldiers and their job, it would have been crazy for these disciples to steal the body. They would have been dead. A Roman soldier wouldn't have allowed for the body to disappear from that grave because their life was at stake. So that theory really doesn't make a lot of sense. Another theory, I think it's called the swan theory, is something like, like Jesus passed out on the cross. They When they bury him, three days later, he wakes up from this, this uh, sleep that he's in, and he actually walks out of the, of, the, of the grave. Now, can you imagine him waking up three days later? Okay, let's say it happened. He passed out. With the beating that he took on Friday, how in the world are you going to walk out of this grave? No medical attention, no nothing. Right? It makes no sense whatsoever. Now, a couple of other points uh, on these com- conspiracy theories that are out there. And if, in fact, the disciples wanted to make up a story, if, in fact, they invented this story, I'm telling you, they went about it in the most illogical way possible. Because they did two things that really speak to me as far as, you know, if, if you have ever lied, and I know most of you have never done that, but I'll confess, I've lied in my life, you know, a time or two. But if you're going to lie... You're going to make sure that all your bases are covered, right? I cannot tell you a lie, and then you go, but what about that, Jose? It's like, oops, all right? I remember the first time I went into a drugstore in Puerto Rico. I was probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old. Is my parents here? Because I don't want to confess in front of my parents. Let me see. Okay. (laughs) I stole a water gun, you know, a little water gun from this drugstore. And I kind of went, I looked around, put it in my pocket. I'm walking out. And the drug, o- the drug store owner ca- catches me, right? He comes right after me. He goes, hey, let me see what's in your pocket. Uh, Nothing. Nothing's in my pocket. Let me see what's in your pocket. So I take out the little water gun, and it was probably a five-cent thing. He goes, you stole that from me. I said, no, I didn't. This was a gift. Yeah, who gave it to you? Uh, it, so the, the lie goes, right? And I start inventing things, and all of a sudden, listen, I just saw you pick it up. Oh, Okay. <laughs> There it ends. So I can imagine the disciples are here inventing a story. They're putting a story together. That's what the the conspiracy theory says. But the first thing they do is they get a Jewish leader, one of the guys that on Friday was asking Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea. He's part of this group that insisted on him being crucified, and they use him to say that he went to Pontius Pilate. He asked for the body. He took the body off the cross and buried it. Now, would that make sense to you? Would you go to the enemy camp to choose somebody from their camp to say he buried the body if you're making up a story? It made absolutely no sense. The second thing they did, I don't know if you know the, the, the fame or, or how the women were looked at during those days, but, but to give you a little idea, they were looked at as, as worse than dogs, really, in those days. And so the disciples are making up the story, and the second thing they say is, listen, Jesus Christ resurrected, and the proof is that these two women saw him first. The first people that saw Jesus resurrected was women. Let me tell you, that alone would have put question marks in the minds of the people listening to this story. So there's no basis for this thing. There's no basis at all. Now, it's interesting. I've been reading this book called Cold Craze Christianity. I don't know how many of you like the, the police shows. You know, I like the police shows when they're investigating stuff. And I used to see the, the show called Cold Case, right? And, uh, and there's a book, Cold Case Christianity. And uh, the author of the book, J. Warner Wallace, is a cold case homicide detective from Chicago. And he says that there are four things that they look for. When they're investigating a cold case, pretty much all they got to go on is an eyewitness testimony. And there's four things they look for on the eyewitness testimony to make sure that they can actually trust what the eyewitness is saying. And these are the four things. The first thing is, were they there? Did they actually see what they're claiming they saw? Were they there? The second thing is, have they been honest and accurate? Okay, do these people, are these people telling the truth? Is their witness statement consistent? Have they lied in the past? Okay, the third thing is, can they be verified? Is there another witness 
that can give us testimony that verifies this testimony, or is there evidence that, that verifies the testimony? And the fourth thing is, do they have an ulterior motive? What's behind this testimony? What are they gaining from it? If they lie to me, do they get something in return? So this is the way he says it. He states, if we can establish that the witness was present, has been accurate and honest in the past, is verified by additional evidence, and has no motive to lie, we can trust what that witness has to say. Okay, so with that in mind, I want to look at some eyewitness accounts. Okay, and I want to start in the book of Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles with us, please open it there, Acts 2. And we're going to be kind of walking around the Bible today. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. We'll put the verses up in the, in the, on the screen. And here in Acts chapter 2, you have Peter giving his first message, right? And he's got a whole group of people, a whole group of Israelites there. He says this on verse 22. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Okay, then he continues. So, so he's telling him, listen, Jesus Christ resurrected. That's good. That's fair. He continues talking. He quotes Psalm 16. And then in verse 31, he comes back. And he's saying, seeing what was to come, he, he's talking about David, okay, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he, the Messiah, was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Now look at verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. You see that? He's saying, Jesus Christ is alive, and we saw him. We are witnesses of him. So you say, okay, so he was there. They saw him. That's fantastic. So my first point to you is the apostles witnessed the resurrection of Christ. Peter says it very clearly. The disciples were together, and with a great crowd, they openly and clearly admitted to witnessing the living Christ. And why is this significant? It's significant because Peter at that moment is jeopardizing not only his life, but the life of all of the disciples with him. All of the disciples. Now, one of the questions was, can we verify the eyewitness testimony with another testimony or with evidence, right? So let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 3, here's Paul writing and he says, For what I receive I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, Right? And then to the 12, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Do you think we can verify that? You got 500. And then he says, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he says, then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So not only did the apostles witness the resurrection of Christ, other 500 people witnessed the resurrection of Christ, and Paul witnessed the resurrection of Christ. Do you see it there? Can we verify the eyewitness testimony? Yes, we can. There is other testimony verifying that. It's incredible, but how can we also, how can we explain the behavior of the disciples if it wasn't for the resurrection of Christ. This guy, just a few days earlier, when Jesus was arrested, remember? They all ran away. They all ran away. They wanted nothing to do. Their leader, which was Peter, the one talking there in Acts, he denied knowing Jesus. He said, I don't know this man. I've never been with him. And just a few days later, he's standing up on front, not caring that his life is in jeopardy and preaching the gospel. 
See, these cowards suddenly become the forefathers of Christianity as they witness the resurrection of Christ. And what about Paul? Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He was killing Christians. What made him change his mind? Why, why did he go now to the enemy camp? If not, because of the resurrection of Christ. See, the resurrection of Christ was witnessed. The second thing I, I want to point at today is that the resurrection of Jesus validates his deity. Now that we know it's true, that it was witnessed, and I can trust this, I got to know this too. The resurrection of Jesus Christ validates that he is God. That he is God. Look with me in Romans 1, verse 4. It says, Jesus, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, the great thing here is Jesus didn't just come back to life. In the Bible, there's many people that came back to life, right? We have the example of Lazarus that came back to life. You have the widow's son. You have Jairus' daughter. There's plenty of people that came back to life. So what's the difference? What's the big deal that Jesus came back to life? Let me point to you at something. The body of the people that were raised from the dead in the Bible was still subject to weakness, to decay, those people, one day, they were going to die again. One day. They were subject to aging. But when Jesus rose from the dead, his body was a new kind of body. See, his body was a perfect body. His body was no longer subject to weakness, no longer subject to aging, no more pain, nothing. His body was an eternal body. He was never, ever going to die Again, he was the first fruits of a new kind of human life. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says it this way. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So what does that mean to us? That means two things. Jesus was who he said he was. He was who he said he was. And secondly, Jesus was the Messiah, and he is the Lord. He is alive today. He was the Messiah and he is the Lord. Now this is how Jesus said it in John 10, 17. He said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. And listen to this. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Now, who's the only one that has authority to give life to somebody? God. He's the only one. So it proves that Jesus is deity. It validates that he is indeed God. Amen? Now, how does that affect me? We answer the first question. Okay, I believe you, Jose. The eyewitness was good. 513, 514 people saw him. That's pretty good. Can you imagine a case in court? I got 500 witnesses. You're dead, buddy. You're done. Right? With three witnesses is enough in the courts. Imagine 514 people. I can believe that. It validates his deity. So what does it do to me? First thing it does is the resurrection of Jesus brings new life. He brings new life. Read with me in Romans 6. And I told you, we're going to be all over the Bible today. So bear with me. Romans 6, starting on verse 3, it says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, he will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old selves was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over 
him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And check this out. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, my friend, we go from spiritual death to spiritual life. You get that? If you don't have Jesus Christ in your life this morning, my friend, I'm sorry to tell you, but you are spiritually dead. But once you accept Jesus Christ, you're brought back to life and that spiritual life. We're no longer slaves of our sinful human nature. You know, we have, we have now the power through the Holy Spirit of God to say no to sin. We are free. We are free. I can now say no to all the things that I surrendered to in the past. You know, I can say no to drinking. I can say no to promiscuity. I can say no to any and to all the addictions that were in my life. I can say no to them. And my friend, if you are a believer in Christ today, you can say no to any and all the things that have controlled your life in the past. You have the power to say no to them because Christ is alive. Because he resurrected. You know, the old Jose is gone. The new one is here. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And this new life is only possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, let me make a side note here. I want to pause here for a second. And let me tell you that because it's mentioned on the verse, baptism is the symbolism of this reality. You know, uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you have never been baptized, man, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to follow Jesus' example and to obey his command. See, go public. Go public, just like Peter did in Acts 2. You need to go public and tell the world that you believe in a resurrected Christ. And the way to do that is going through the waters of baptism. So I want to encourage you, if you have never done it, listen, we're going to take you on the water. We're going to symbolize the burial. The old you is going to go down. And then we're going to resurrect you again with a brand new life, brand new spiritual life. So I encourage you to do that if you have never done it. My last point here is the resurrection of Jesus gives us victory. He gives us new life, and he gives us victory. In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you see the two requirements? If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will be reconciled with God and you will be victorious over your sin. There's three things that the resurrection of Christ ensures in our lives. The first thing is Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration. That's what we've been talking about. First Peter puts it this way. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, regeneration, new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see? Clearly, Peter is associating the resurrection of Christ with our new life, with regeneration. And if you go and read Ephesians, we won't go there, but Paul in there states that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is a work in the life of the believer. We have that power in our lives today. Not only does the resurrection ensure our regeneration, but also it ensures our justification. It ensures our justification. Romans 4.25, it says, 
uh, as Paul is stating, that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was raised to life for our justification. So what does this mean? What does it mean? It means this. It means that God the Father, by raising Jesus from the dead, he was giving his seal of approval to God's work of suffering and dying for our sins and rendering his work complete. And there was no need for Christ to remain dead. There was no penalty left to pay for sin. There was no wrath of God to bear. No more guilt or liability for punishment. God declared approval and sufficiency in the work of God. And this is what that means to you and me. In doing that, God has given us his justification because it says in Ephesians 2, it says he raised us up in him. So by raising us up in him, God's approval of Jesus is also a declaration of his approval of us. You see, we are justified in God's eyes because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it ensures my regeneration. It ensures my justification. And lastly, Christ's resurrection ensures our resurrected bodies. Our resurrected bodies. There are, there are many passages in the Bible that talk about the reality of us getting a new body when we're resurrected, right? But uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15 and just see a couple of verses in there. We will not, we're not going to read the entire passage. But, but first of all, we're going to look back at verse 20. We saw that before. It says, but Christ had indeed raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does first fruits mean? First fruits was an agricultural term, right? And it meant, you know, if you saw the first fruit of, of the harvest, you knew what kind of harvest you were going to have because the other fruits were going to look just like the one you, you grabbed. If this was delicious orange and it was really juicy and good, the rest, I can pretty much say, are going to be the same, right? But what he's saying about Christ being the first fruit, just like, like that happens with fruits, Christ being the first fruit shows what our resurrected bodies will be like when God raises up from the dead in his final harvest. See, we're going to have a body just like Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians with me. We'll read a few verses. Starting on verse 50, it says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. See that? In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be ra raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see? And at the resurrection of the dead, we will have new bodies. Those bodies are not going to be subject to aging anymore. I am going to look good in heaven. I am going to have no pain. My wife is going to be happy when she sees me in heaven. We will be like him. The power of the resurrection of Christ gives us victory over death. So today, we can believe that the resurrection of Christ was real because it was witnessed. Today, we can affirm that Jesus is God. Because his resurrection validates that. But more importantly today, we can have a new life. You can have a new life today. 
And you can have victory over sin today because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we saw it before. Declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead and you will be saved. Would you stand with me? Lord God, as we study the resurrection of your son Jesus, I can't help but think of of the hope that that gives me, of the hope that it gives all of us. The only reason we have hope to see our loved ones that have gone before us is that Christ raised from the dead, that he was raised from the dead. If the resurrection wouldn't have happened, we would have no hope. So God, I thank you this morning. I thank you that we have hope in you. We have hope because the work that you did in the cross was enough. The burial, the resurrection makes me justified before God. How can we express that love? Lord, I ask for those that don't know you this morning. And Father, maybe are those that that claim to know you, but they really haven't been living in the power of the resurrection. They're still living like like their old selves. Father, how I ask that you open their spiritual eyes this morning, that you show them that the resurrection can be real in their lives, that all they need to do, Lord, is accept the work that you already did and come to you. And come to you. Father, I pray that this morning you will touch him in a mighty way, Lord. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.